So welcome everyone to this evening's mini medical school. Congratulations to all of you who have been accepted into this very prestigious medical school. Um, so if you think of high intensity interval training as this, the image you see in front of you, this evening is really for you. Training for an Olympic event, uh, training for a marathon, training for a triathlon, yeah, it will help, but if you are interested in promoting healthy aging, HIT is also for you. It's for all of us who want to get the most out of life. And so this evening, I'd like to welcome you. I'm Dr. Roseanne Berger. I am the director of the Mini Medical School uh, and the Senior Associate Dean for Graduate Medical Education. I'm also very interested in learning about this program. So as in all of our many mini medical school uh, curricula, we have planned this evening to combine basic science with the application of basic science to health and clinical medicine. And we have, as we do in every medical school, mini medical school, some experts in the field to help teach us. Uh, this evening, we have three folks uh, who are expert in the area of high intensity interval training and in the field of healthy aging. Uh, Dr. Bruce Trone is a professor of medicine and the chief of geriatrics and palliative medicine and the director of the Center of Successful Aging. Uh, he is a thought leader in aging related geroscience and molecular biology and a regional leader in geriatric care. We also have Dr. Ken Seldine. He's a research assistant professor at the University of Buffalo and the VA Western New York Healthcare System. He's a gerontologist and a sports enthusiast who describes himself as saying that he is a competitive guy. He's always looking for the special competitive edge, whether it's in basketball, tennis, uh, chess, or successful aging. And he does this, gets this competitive edge by scouring the biology literature. I think we have more than one tennis player speaking tonight. I just heard Dr. Tron also engages in that sport. And we also have with us Dr. Nikhil Satchidanan. Dr. Satchidanan has his PhD uh, uh, in geroscience, and he is also an exercise physiologist. He too is seeking novel engaging ways to help older adults improve their lives through physical activity, social support, and most importantly, play. Before starting, I just wanna really uh, give a special thank you to our mini medical advisory board who helps us develop the curriculum for these programs, uh, as well as a special thank you to Jen Britton uh, from the Medical Alumni Association who helps us shape this program as well. Uh, and of course, a special shout out to our mini med school sponsor, UBMD. 
So with that, uh, I would like to introduce Dr. Bruce Trone. Uh, and before Dr. Trone starts his presentation, I'd like to remind everyone that we have received questions in advance, which we will be directing towards our speakers this evening. If you wanna place questions in the chat, please feel free to do so. We'll try to get to as many as we can. If not, this session is being recorded on YouTube. We will send the link out to all of those who have registered as uni medical students. Dr. Trom. Okay, good evening. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much, Dr. Berger. It's uh, great that uh, we've been asked to present this program. And, and actually, as I'm thinking about it, uh, both uh, uh, Ken and Nick and I all in one way or another practice high intensity interval training. So we're, I guess it's like the hair club for men. Uh, we're not just selling it, but we're also uh, customers at the same time. So I'm going to share my screen. And a little bit of a lag and please someone give me some feedback so we know that it's showing up for you folks. Yes, it is. Okay, super. Okay, so uh, our title, obviously in front of you, Promoting Healthy Aging. And we believe very much that it's worthwhile considering high intensity interval training. And so we're gonna take you on a hop, skip and jump through aspects of our work uh, and a little bit of others work. And I'll start off, then Dr. Sacha Dinan will be next and then Dr. Saldin, and then I'll close things up with just a few uh, end, end slides, and then hopefully we'll be able to answer as many questions as possible. So we're all members of the Division of Geriatrics and Palliative Medicine in the Department of Medicine, uh, and also part of the Center for Successful Aging. And I'm very proud to say that I've been for 32 years, plus a physician investigator for the Veterans Affairs Health System, and now part of the VA Western New York Healthcare System. And both Dr. Sacha Danan and Dr. Saldin also are investigators at the VA. And I think it's important to mention that we have funding through a number of sources. We're very fortunate in that regard. Uh, and I wanna assure everyone that we have no relevant conflicts of interest. And I think it's very important to acknowledge the uh, very experienced and passionate and committed members of our team. Uh, we have a number of great folks uh, directly in our laboratory. Uh, and also we have collaborators both at the UB and the Veterans Affairs Medical Center. So what is our objective? Well, many of you might have seen this uh, cartoon a number of years ago, maybe a couple decades ago in the New Yorker. And we see that the wife is saying to the husband, good news, honey, 70 is the new 50. Well, I think we're here because we wanna consider whether or not we can make 80 the new 60. And why stop there? Perhaps even make 90 the new 70. So here's a picture of a 105 year old Japanese man who uh, a few years ago set a new 100 meter sprint record for his age. I'm wondering if folks might wanna guess how fast that would be. We know the world record is uh, under 10 seconds. Well, this individual did it, he did Kichi Miyazaki in 42 plus seconds, but that was a world record. And I think it'd be fair to say that at the age of 105, he's an example of successful aging. So here's another individual, actually a cousin of mine, Mr. Bert Asquith, who lived uh, to his 104th year. And this was actually a picture that I took of him at his 104th birthday party. And in the previous slide, we saw a great example of physical performance. And while Bert was really playing tennis wonderfully into his early 90s, he was also a great example of cognitive capacity, of preserving his ability to stay fit upstairs as well as downstairs. And indeed, uh, he died on a Sunday from a heart attack, but that Friday, he was still full-time in the office running the bus company he had started 65 to 70 years ago. So we all hopefully want to strive for successful aging, not just physically, but cognitively. And we have another example of that here, because I think there are going to be many folks that say, well, gee, if I'm 70 or 80 or even 90, 
Should I be exercising? Should I be participating in high intensity interval training? Well, this happens to be Dr. Berger, Berger's mother, uh, Bernice, who unfortunately died recently, but this was at the age of 99. And so exercise at any age is a mantra that we embrace. And you'll hear about some of the trials that we've uh, been undertaking towards that end. So if I could, I'd love to be able to write a prescription for everybody and ask you to take a pill that would maybe improve your sleep, enhance your cardiovascular function, boost your immune, immune function, make your bones stronger. Wouldn't you wanna take that? And also perhaps if it could make your muscles better, if it could improve your weight control, if it could improve blood pressure, if it could reduce depression and reduce stress, and if it could improve your cognition, wouldn't you all wanna take that pill? But there's a catch. It's a big one. There's no such pill. And I think many of you probably would anticipate the prescription is actually exercise. It's not a pill. And we know, and this is old news in a way, and this is from a systematic review almost 10 years ago, that showed that exercise can help even frail older adults in very many parameters. So increasing their functional performance, their daily walking speed, getting out of a chair, rising up and climbing stairs. It decreases depression and the fear of falling. But it was interesting because the conclusion that the authors had was that the studies they reviewed, and it was a systematic meta-analysis, were that most folks needed at least three months. They needed at least 45 to 60 minutes three times a week. And you had to reach a high level of resistance doing three sets of eight with this 80% maximum rep. And so it's not a surprise, and I think we all accept that exercise is beneficial, but there's a problem. Not enough of us actually do it. So there's decent data on this. So the federal government has a number of activity guidelines, and the typical guideline is for 150 minutes a week of moderate exercise, or maybe 75 minutes a week of more vigorous exercise, hopefully with a little bit of strength training tossed in. But when you go ahead and look at the data, the number of folks who at increasing ages participate in that decreases substantially. So if you're 75 or older, it's much less than 10%. And gee, 25 to 65, that's nothing really to crow about. So how can we perhaps address this issue? And one of the ways is with high intensity interval training because you get more bang for your buck and benefits in less time. So there are a number of studies which show that this clearly applies uh, that you can get with as few as three days a week and four minutes of the high intensity intervals improvements in your heart function that even as little as three minutes can help. And there's even, there are even several studies that suggest that one minute intervals might be enough to do the trick. So we've embarked uh, for the last couple of years on a, a path that really wants to study high intensity interval training. And of course, we want to bring this to individuals in the community. Some of you may recognize this is uh, Leonardo da Vinci's Vit, uh, Vitruvian man, but we did not start with men or women. We started with mice. And the reason why we did that is because mice age over a period of two years for most of their lifespan. Their genetic background and their lifestyles are much more easily controlled than people. So they actually present a very good model for this. And about four years ago, uh, we published in our lab a study on high intensity interval training in older mice. And indeed, uh, and this was really very pleasurable, uh, Dr. Saldine and I were interviewed by Gretchen Reynolds for the New York Times and in the July 12th issue, she actually profiled our study. Now, interestingly enough, even though it was a study on mice, they showed a picture of a number of people, including an older gentleman working out on the extra cycle. And also she did a good job of saying how this could lay a foundation for human studies. But I'm gonna start off and tell you a little bit about what we did with these mice, because we're very proud that we've been able to set up a paradigm that goes from the bench top to the bedside, or as Dr. Sajidanan will tell you about, from the lab to the living room. So we developed a model, and here Ken Seldine really took the lead in devising an algorithm in how to train our mice. And we did it with a, an inclined uh, treadmill. So 
this was an exercise regimen that had the mice at 25 degrees moving uphill on their treadmill. And the way it was done was to give them a warm up space of about three minutes, and then to give them three higher intensity efforts interspersed with lower intensity intervals. And then finally, a run for it all dash at the end. So this meant that the total session time was only 10 minutes and we did it only three times a week. And now the thing that really distinguished what we were doing is that to our knowledge, this is the first time that anyone had used a model system, in this case mice, and actually looked at truly older mice. These mice were 24 months old and they, we did this over a period of time for 28 months. That's typically around a 70 to 80 year old individual. And we found, and no one had actually shown this before, that doing this uphill running uh, exercise didn't just boost their running, but it enhanced their grip strength, their treadmill endurance, their sprint ability, and their regular walking speed. In other words, when they just ambled from one end to the other. And as you can see, the blue were those mice that were uh, uh, subjected to the high intensity interval training, and the other mice were sedentary, and they were put on non-moving treadmills. Slide in the band. So not only, not only did it increase their functional parameters, but we we're able to see that this improved their muscle mass in their legs. And just to reassure everybody, we started out with male mice, but there's no doubt this works in female mice also. And it's important to show that, by the way, we don't wanna make assumptions scientifically, okay? Uh, are the slides changing here? I just got something, uh, can, what slide, can somebody give me some feedback? It should say, hit works in female mice too. You're oh, on the, the, the are mouse, moving. Vitruvian mouse. Oh, wow. Okay, thank you. Let's, um, I'm going to stop the share. I'm glad that uh, Ken is just uh, a few doors away from me and we'll start sharing again. They were changing for me, but I guess not for everyone else. Let's give it another shot. Please tell me what you see. Loading. Okay. Are we not getting there? I have a blank no. screen. Wow. Okay, let's give this one more shot. Says it's just Sorry, a... folks. And uh, I'm gonna do this a little bit differently. Let me, and if necessary, we will uh, just flip through the slides. Let's see if we can get there. Okay. And we'll go back. Technology, we're all Beholding to it, obviously, in this pandemic era. The loading. Okay. Hmm. You don't see it yet? No. Oh, that's Boy. frustrating. We did a tech check earlier, and it seemed to be doing the job, and it's not now. So one final thing. Let me... Sorry, folks. Uh, what we may want to do is skip to one of the other presenters while I try to work this out, but let me give it a shot here. Do you see my desktop at all right now? You see anything? No, it just mice work better. Mice work better than the slide for a second. Yes, okay. So let me let me do one more thing here. And you know, I've quit my other programs too because uh, I wanted to make sure that I was not going to interfere. So let's even quit. Some background. Dr. Sherwin, what if you made someone else the host right now? And then you could just ask them to advance the slides. Um, that'll be tough, but thanks, Linda. Oh, give it oh one more sorry. Shot. No, no, that's that's a great suggestion. Let's give one more shot. Okay. Okay. The problem is that the slides aren't in the cloud. They're on my computer at the moment. Oh. But I can transfer them. Okay, so let's give it one more shot. If not, then we're gonna pass the baton, so to speak. And, okay. They're loaded. Okay. It's up now. Gotta, there we go. It's up. They're back. So let's, uh, back. let's see, and I'll scoop through. Okay, thank you for your patience, folks. 
is a rapid reinforcement and repetition, but there will not be a quiz at the end. Okay. Okay. So tell me, can you see the New York Times article? Yes, we can. Okay, fantastic. So I was referring to this picture and the article that was published in July 12, 2017, which is a lot of fun. That's not a scientific journal, obviously, but sort of neat that uh, uh, it caught the attention of a, uh, a different audience. And then what I was showing here was the actual apparatus where we actually exercise the mice. So we set this treadmill, there are actually uh, multiple treadmills inside there at a 25 degree incline, and we let them do their, their thing. And their thing is this algorithm that Ken Seldin helped to put together, uh, where we see that we start off with an, a three minute warm up interval to the left here. And then we have three one minute, very high intensity intervals, and then three one minute slower intervals, and then they end with a dash. Now there's an important point here, and this goes back to uh, Dr. Berger's mother, and that is that we individually tailor the exercise intensity for the mice. So we actually categorized the mice into three groups and started them at three different levels. And then during the uh, 16 weeks that they were being trained, if they happened to continue to improve, we'd up their intensity. If they were not able to continue to improve, we reduce their intensity. This is a very, very key point because we did this and we we're doing this with our human participants. And so this is where the total time in a single session is 10 minutes, but the frequency is only three times a week. And so we saw a boost in physical performance across the board for grip strength, treadmill endurance when it was flat, also when running up, and then their normal gait speed. So we didn't ask them to run. We actually watched as they walked across a one meter distance. And we found out that those mice that had been in the high intensity interval training group did substantially better. And these were, again, as I mentioned, very old mice in the 70 to 80 year old range for human equivalency. And we also found that it increased their muscle mass. And as I also mentioned, this works in females as well as males. This is very important scientifically because we can't make assumptions that uh, sex, uh, uh, sexes respond in the same way. Now, I should say that these were older females also, so they were not reproductive in their reproductive uh, stage. So this laid the foundation, and we're very proud of this, that here we were working at the bench top with our mouse model, and we we're able to develop an algorithm that we could apply to human participants. And again, uh, we were very fortunate to have some popular press in this regard, the Buffalo News, you can see back in 2019, also highlighted some of our efforts. And these efforts were to bring this to the bedside. So we actually were successful in obtaining funding from the Veterans Affairs. And this was for a pilot study to make sure that we could recruit successfully and keep our participants enrolled in a high intensity interval training program. So even though there had been a number of studies beforehand, there weren't any studies in veterans. And there was a study in older 90 year olds, but again, they weren't veterans. So we wanted to focus on this. And we created a similar algorithm, a slight difference here. And that is on either end, we had a little bit more of a ramp up time. And then at the end, a ramp down, cool down time. But here, in order to be able to assess the uh, potential uh, capacity for the intensity levels, uh, we had our collaborator, uh, Dr. Jeffrey Mader, along with Dr. Sachi Danan, who's an exercise physiologist, do exercise testing to determine what's called their VO2 max, their capability in uh, breathing in oxygen. And we set their intensity level to reach 80% of their VO2 max. And while they're in between these high intervals at 50%. And this was also uh, about an 11 to 12 minute period of time. And so we're very fortunate. This was just a pilot study. We have 42 participants. You can see their average age was 70, though we had, I think it was three individuals who were 85 years old. Uh, we had a mix uh, culturally and racially with about uh, two thirds being white and a little bit more than one third African American. And we also classified them as either non-frail, robust, pre-frail, 
and potentially at a situation where they were going to become frail and then four frail individuals. This was the poster that we used to recruit individuals. And on the right side is a programmable recumbent bicycle. We actually purchased with the uh, grant funds from the VA. We have two of them. And that allowed us to program in these stages for the high intensity interval training. So to our great satisfaction, though we may not say our surprise, the high intensity interval training boosts leg strength and both the ability to work harder and to breathe more uh, in these individuals. This is a, a partial set of results. We're still collate, uh, collating the data, but leg strength improved, workload improved, and ventilation improved. And those of you who are keen eyed or hopefully have a large screen will see there are a couple of exceptions in there. I'm gonna mention that in the next slide. Now, this is very important, of course, and not surprising, but it was still a hypothesis. The hit increased the endurance of the participants. And so one way to check that is to do a six minute walk. And we see here that the great majority of individuals in green improved their six minute walk distances. So you give them the same amount of time, you see how far they can go at their normal pace. But interestingly enough, there were four individuals who declined and one who stayed the same. Similarly, if we, we check their VO2 max, both before and after the uh, 12 weeks of high intensity interval training, and we can see that the great majority improved. That's what we would expect, but three did not. So an important question to which we do not have the answer is why were these individuals, the four on the left and the three on the right, actually exhibiting a decline? And that's something where we want to look at the molecular mechanisms underlying that. And actually, Dr. Sachin will show you a slide that outlines that. And here's, I think, a really uh, great aspect to this. In the majority of individuals, the high intensity interval training program improved their cognitive ability. Now, again, we see that there are a handful, in this case, five who appear to decline and two that stayed the same, uh, three that stayed the same but the majority improve. And I think all of us take, take it as a given that exercise helps with cognition, but in fact, it's not a very well proven uh, phenomenon. And yet here's something where we believe we have an opportunity to show that not only does exercise improve cognition, but it's high intensity interval training that does that. And this I think is also very important because it's not just about running farther, about climbing a flight of stairs or even having better cognition and better memory, but we really want to improve quality of life. Here's where the concept of successful aging really comes into play. And indeed, the great majority of individuals did say, based upon what are validated questionnaires, mind you, that they felt better about themselves and about their quality of life from before and after the high intensity interval training. Again, there are a number of folks who did not. So we want to try to investigate why. And indeed here, uh, is an individual participant uh, who was very happy with his hit. Uh, in the background in the green jersey is uh, Jonas Rede. He's one of our really wonderful research associates. And Dr. Saldin is smiling there on the right. And we did give him a certificate for completing the uh, program. So the conclusions from my presentation part are that short session high intensity interval training. And by the way, the key here is short. It's only 10 minutes in veterans capture many of the benefits that we saw in mice. So that means strength and endurance gains, and that these benefits extend well beyond the physical to include potential improvements in cognition and quality of life. And I think we're onto something, and the question is, how can we continue to bring this out into the community? Okay, that's my part to stop here. I'm gonna stop sharing, and I'm gonna pass it on to Dr. Satchidanan. Okay, can everybody see this? Are we okay, good. Yes. All right, thank you. So um, what I'd like to do is to introduce a, a handful of studies um, that are in various um, stages of completion and development, but they, they really highlight the, <clears throat> the work that we've been doing over the past several years, focused on developing um, a better knowledge base around the impacts of HIT on successful aging. 
So a lot of the work that I do is focused on developing community-based interventions to improve cognition and physical function in older adults. And a couple of them have been delivered in um, underserved in minority communities. So one of them is ThinkFit, and it's a good example of the work that I've been doing for the past few years. Now, this intervention was a dual task intervention using the SmartFit cognitive motor training system. Now, this system is essentially an extra gaming system that allows for um, cognitive engagement through these kind of interactive cognitive games. And you can see in the picture where this, um, one of our, our participants is um, playing this game where you have to tap using the pool noodles um, back and forth while balancing on one foot. So the idea here is that we're engaging uh, the cognition and motor training at the same time. It was a group-based intervention and it was implemented in partnership with the William Emsley YMCA. And the purpose, uh, one of the major purposes of this was really to, um, to bring community members in together with the YMCA staff members and our research team in order to develop this intervention. And it took about roughly a year to develop um, where we had focus groups and user groups and several people playing the games together in order to really craft the most appealing and enjoyable intervention and training experience. We included in the first round um, that ended right after, right when COVID started to get problematic, um, we had 11 older adults, they were 68 to 85 years of age, and they all screened positive for mild cognitive impairment. It was a 16 week intervention with two um, one hour training sessions per week. And we designed it to improve balance, walking, attention, and task switching. And what we found after 60, 16 weeks of training is that the dual task intervention improved one leg balance. So when participants were asked to stand on their non-dominant leg for as long as possible, um, at baseline, you can see they had, about, had a mean of about 4.3 4 seconds um, where they were able to stand on one foot. After the intervention, after six weeks of training, um, the mean was about just under 10. It was about 9.8 seconds. So we can see here that now this is important and has implications related to fall prevention and that older adults who are unable to stand on one leg for uh, at least five seconds have an increased risk of falling. So at least within, this part, within our participants, we can say that there was some improvement in that and a reduction in their risk of falling. In addition, we found that um, dual task training improved their attention and their ability to, to switch from one task to another. So I'm just gonna skip ahead real, real quickly to describe the test that we use to, de to determine this. The test is called the trail making test and it's really a neuropsychological assessment of attention and task switching. And participants are asked to beginning, beginning with number, the number one to alternatively, alternately connect the dots from a number to a letter and then back to a number. So just as shown here, one to A, then to two, then to B, three, and then to C. And if we go back, we can see that their times improved. So the red column demonstrates or shows that they had a mean of about 142. And then after that, after the 16 week intervention, it went down to a mean of about 134 seconds. So Again, this shows, this demonstrates that they were able to improve their task switching with um, 16 weeks of intervention. <clears throat> because it was a community-based intervention, we were also focused on the patient's or the participant's perspectives related to their interaction with the device, um, related their, to their interaction with each other, and really trying to get a sense of how we can craft the most usable and appealing intervention. And so we found a, a very high level of adherence where 100% of participants completed at least 30 out of the 32 exercise sessions. And we also found that participants enjoyed participating a great deal. Um, we had 100% of the participants reporting at least a nine out of 10 points and the vast majority reported a 10. So when asked during an interview, the, all of the participants felt that they, they really enjoyed it and were getting something out of it. We also found that, again, through these brief interviews, that 
100% of the participants reported some perceived benefit to, part, to being in the intervention. They, re they reported that they had more confidence walking. They felt less shaky on their feet. They felt that their memory was better and they had, they had a sharper mind. Many of the participants, as I said before, really reported enjoyment and having a good time. And they all really viewed it as an important opportunity to socialize with friends and to meet new people. So all of this information was really critical because as we move forward with this, with this program, um, with in, in partnership with the YMCA, the intention is to use all of this information to create really the most appealing and, and most effective intervention that truly meets the needs of this population. And we found that all of the participants reported really, they wanted to continue the, the intervention after the study ended. So we're working with the William Emsley YMCA now um, to find a way to incorporate this into their regular programming. I wanted to uh, summarize this study with uh, a, a, a little excerpt from a, a letter that I received from one of the participants. She said, I will admit, 12 weeks ago, my friends dragged me to that place. I did not want to carry that six pound ball all over the place or stand on one foot looking like a fool. But halfway through the class, I was too busy laughing, sweating and playing with my friends to think about any of that. And now 12 weeks later, <clears throat> I can stand on one foot without being afraid of falling. I can walk farther than I could five years ago. And I have a new group of friends who, I, who laugh with me and support me. And I, I think this is important because while it, it's only one person, it really does reflect um, the sort of this health status and function of the vast majority of our participants when they started out. You know, Beatrice, which is a pseudonym, but she started out very shaky. Um, when we asked her to do anything which, which involved shifting weight to one, from one foot to another, she immediately grabbed either the wall in front of her or the chair that we had next to her for support. Halfway through the intervention at six, at, at the, at the six week mark, she felt very, very different about even participating in physical activity. So she was much more confident on her feet and much more, much more stable and felt much better about being active. And this is something that I think is critically important because any physical activity, any level of physical activity participation is going to give people a bit more self-efficacy, that feeling that they can accomplish that activity. And moving forward, this is something we're going to build into the future interventions. So <clears throat> I'd like to shift gears a little bit. Um, and because we ended right when COVID started to get bad here in Buffalo, um, we, were really at a, we were at a loss in terms of what we could do to support older adults who are isolated at home. So through um, the pilot funding available through the Center for Six, or Center Clinical and Translational Science Institute here at UB, um, I received some pilot funding and this is a study that is now in development. So it is a home-based version of the training to improve dual task performance. And in this, the dual task training itself is really a combination of cardio kickboxing, balance training and functional training guided by weekly 45 minute videos. So there are two training sessions per week and they're themed based upon the week. So one week might be the cardio kickboxing, all non-contact, non -contact, of course, um, one would be the balance training and then more functional training. And we're currently, in, we're currently developing the video content for that intervention. We very soon will be recruiting 20 older adults who are 65 years of age or older to participate. And we're also very focused on measures of implementation. So we want to know what the feasibility is. We want to know the fidelity of it. You know, was the intervention um, um, disseminated or implemented in the way that it was intended. For these home-based programs, that is one of the critical components because we want to know that the intervention looks the way that we intended it to look. And of course, as always, I'm very, fo very much focused on better understanding the influences on participation and enjoyment. <clears throat> Within that study, we are we're focused on um, assessing balance, muscle strength, walking and critically dual task ability. So we want to know in the real world, are there benefits to this dual task training? So <clears throat> that all of that home-based work kind of has inspired what we're moving into now into the future. And that is a high intensity interval training at home. And so the aims of this study 
are to describe the benefits of home and center-based high intensity interval training on physical and cognitive performance and quality of life in older adults. Now, beyond that, which is something that Bruce has uh, touched upon, is that we also want to determine the impacts of high intensity interval training on key parameters um, related to our to an older adult's ability to recover from um, some hit to homeostasis, some hit to their physiological functioning. This term that we'll get into is called resilience. So we're interested in these candidate markers and trying to explore what impact they have on resilience. So we're focused on oxygenation, both in the skeletal muscle and in the brain, changes in cognition and changes in heart rate. And underlying all of this that is critically important is to determine if these benefits of doing high intensity interval training are accompanied by changes in the biology, in the microRNA profiles, in biomarkers of inflammation and in metabolism. And so this slide really helps to sum up um, our laboratory to living room approach to studying resilience in older adults and studying all of these key components that are critical to successful aging. And at the same time, being able then to under, understand the underlying mechanisms related to that to metabolism, microRNA profiles and markers of inflammation. So when we think about the concept of resilience, we need to know a little bit more about what that might, what that is and why it's important. So resilience in aging really is our ability to, with, to overcome um, or recover from hits to homeostasis, right? Challenges based up, or challenges from health related stressors that we, that we may experience in our lives. And this is really critical to successful aging because we need to be able to recover from those hits that are quite common. And I'll take, so as an example, if you have an older adult, <clears throat> falling is common with, with older adults and can lead to hip fractures. So you might have one older adult who has, who is quite resilient, who is able then <clears throat> to recover because they have the adaptive reserves. So they, they are resilient. Conversely, you might have, you have an older adult who may not be as resilient and that fall and that injury from the fall can result in a progressive decline and loss of independence and a, and a dependence upon the healthcare system that is profound. So we, we really are interested not only in the, these mechanisms surrounding resilience, but also to better understand how HIT in particular and exercise in general has an inf uh, what role we, we can see for HIT in improving resilience in older adults. So <clears throat> we need to be able to measure resilience and really the, the jury is not hasn't really fully decided on how to go about this in the best way. But over time, we've learned that it really requires a dynamic perspective. We need to be able to explore changes over time in key candidate physiological and, and functional variables in response to an experimental stressor, such as exercise itself. So you can apply an exercise stimulus, like an exercise test, and then observe over time, over during the course of that test, changes that occur. So we're interested, in, again, in looking at um, oxygenation, both in the brain and in the skeletal, exercising skeletal muscle, changes in cognition or cognitive recovery following an exercise challenge. And we're also interested in changes in heart rate and heart rate variability as candidate markers of resilience. This is gonna give us a better idea of how to define resilience. So our HIT at home protocol is as follows. Um, the intervention training schedule is three times per week um, for 12 weeks, both in the center-based and in the home-based. The mode of delivery of the intervention itself is 10 minutes of recumbent cycling. The plan here is then is to provide recumbent cycles to the older adults who are in the home-based trial. And here's where it gets um, a, a bit unique. So monitoring for both safety and also for um, <clears throat> participation and for adherence to the protocol can be done very easily in a center-based setting. You can have a research associate or a trainer with them all the time within, within each session. We are proposing a live remote via video conference method of monitoring and keeping people motivated during the home-based trial. 
So to sum up, <clears throat> we're very interested in understanding the, <clears throat> the functional components of resilience and how, <clears throat> and how we can apply a benchtop to implementation um, approach to studying resilience and the impact that hit that high intensity interval training has on resilience and our ability to recover from stress stressors. We're also interested <clears throat> in some of the molecular biomarkers that I spoke about earlier, mitochondrial energetics, microRNA profiles, and markers of inflammation to see how high intensity in interval training impacts those markers. And ultimately, all of these pieces we want to bring together in order to develop exercise-based therapies for clinical and community settings um, to pull in a cohort of older adults, perhaps some listening today, in order to um, develop longitudinal, long-term longitudinal studies to test those exercise-based therapies and to develop prediction models focused on predicting resilience and aging. If we can do all of these things together, we can help older adults maintain their independence and live successfully as long as possible. Thank you. So I'm going to unshare. Okay, uh, welcome everybody. Thank you for this uh, opportunity and thank you, uh, Nick. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen now. Hopefully this is showing up well. Yes. Okay, and uh, so for my talk, I, I was really hoping um, that I could uh, convince you to kind of, in addition to when you think about exercise, also think about some nutritional aspects, uh, specifically about vitamin D. And so uh, love him or hate him, I'm going to start the presentation with this guy. Um, well, actually, let's, let's be honest here. We're Buffalonians. We hate this guy. But uh, what's kind of remarkable to me is he won a Super Bowl at the age of 43. So that has to be like 110 or 120 in football years. Uh, and so as a biologist, I'm kind of uh, curious, you know, what, what is he doing to uh, be so prolific at his age in a very tough league? Um, is, is this something that we could use to allow individuals in their 80s and 90s to have more functional independence? And so one of the aspects that I found that he does is he takes vitamin D. Um, well, actually, let's uh, be honest, he sells vitamin D. Um, I, Bruce has already used this line, but I'll, I'll go ahead and reuse it. Uh, I'm assuming that since he is the owner and he must therefore be a client as well. And so uh, what is vitamin D exactly? Well, vitamin D is considered the sunshine vitamin. And so it's, it's so named because uh, sunlight converts cholesterols in our skin into vitamin D3, uh, which is called colchalciferol. And so a study came out that showed that about 15 minutes of uh, noontime summer sun would generate about 10,000 to 15,000 IU of vitamin D. Now this is going to differ depending on race, uh, depending on age and uh, many other aspects, but uh, Luckily, we could also get our vitamin D through uh, diet. And uh, for those who might uh, take down a nice cut of salmon, that could generate about 1,000 IU for you. However, uh, most foods do not contain much vitamin D. And, uh, the current, and we could also get it through supplementation, uh, for which the uh, National Academy of Medicine recommends 1,000 IU. Uh, however, most of the vitamin D community, and uh, myself included, I, I personally take about 2,000 IU daily. Um, and so as we take the cold calciferol, it gets converted by our livers into 25 hydroxy vitamin D, also called calcidiol. And when you go in for a vitamin D test to see if you are sufficient or deficient, uh, this is the biomarker they're looking for in your blood. However, this is not the active form of vitamin D. Um, this form of vitamin D is converted by various tissues and it uh, then is converted into 125 dihydroxy vitamin D, also called calcitriol. And calcitriol is then picked up by vitamin D receptors in our various tissues, and it will go on to do all the different things that vitamin D does. And so vitamin D uh, insufficiency or low vitamin D uh, is also considered the stealthy epidemic. And several studies have indicated 
that as many as 70% are estimated have low vitamin D. And so this threshold is considered less than 30 nanograms per ml in that 25 hydroxy test. What was interesting is we did a study in Florida where you have lots of sunshine in Southern Florida. However, we found that 90% of the older adults in that study were below vitamin D. So what about Western New York? Well, it may just be the uh, uh, fact that we know in winters we get no sunshine. So it seems like we're doing much better than the national average here. Uh, but 50% is still a sizable number and it raises a lot of concerns, uh, particularly with uh, this many people uh, low in vitamin D, it raises the possibility that some people are deficient or insufficient for maybe 10, 20, 30 years. And so that's where we think there might be some problems. And so we developed a mouse model to study this scenario. Uh, as Bruce was mentioning, mice live for about uh, two to three years. And so what we did is we took a mouse and we measured their vitamin D levels and tracked them from six months of age to, 20, to 18 months of age. So this is like a study uh, of 25 year olds going to about 50 years of age. What we did is uh, we tested the vitamin D levels and mice typically get 1000 IU per kilogram of their chow. And this puts them into that, what we consider vitamin D sufficient level above 30 nanograms per ml. However, we then take uh, the chow when we put one eighth of that amount, so 125 IU. And what we find is that the mice plunge rapidly into vitamin D insufficiency. The cutoff or deficiency is below 10 nanograms per ml. So these mice are just above that level. Uh, what was also interesting to us is that if we then switch them from that 125 back to 1000, uh, so-called repletion, that this process happens very quickly. Uh, mice have uh, very rapid metabolisms. However, uh, this might be in the ballpark of what we might see for humans if we start supplementing. And so we also looked at what happens to their physical performance all this time. And uh, we, we kind of hit them with a mouse Olympics, testing speed, endurance, uh, strength. And a couple areas that uh, kind of shot up at us was, um, one, we saw that their grip endurance was lower. And so uh, this is, a, we do a test where we invert a mouse and we see how long they could cling and hold on for. And it's the equivalent of this uh, young uh, lady here trying to do a pull up. And we see that the mice that were vitamin D insufficient for this period of time, basically one year, were, sufficient, were uh, significantly lower in their grip endurance. Also importantly, we identified gait disturbances uh, in these mice, which is very important uh, uh, clinical parameter in geriatrics. Uh, gait speed is an indicator of uh, adverse events in the near future. And uh, if you have a slow gait speed, that's something we watch out for. And so uh, vitamin D insufficiency for long periods of time seemed to have dramatic effects on physical performance. And a recent study came out that suggests that your vitamin D status might affect the results from an exercise. Um, in this case, uh, this is a group of soccer players that they gave vitamin D for six weeks at 6,000 IU and daily. And uh, what they found after the six weeks is, uh, well, as we would expect, the vitamin D levels in these participants increased. But what they also found was that their five meter sprint speeds were faster. So there was a, a, a adaptation to the exercise that was better for the highly sufficient individuals. And so now we're kind of curious, okay, so what might vitamin D be doing? And so we're first gonna look um, at whether it might be some aspect of muscle uh, metabolism. And we're gonna look first at the nuclei. And, and so actually this is an experiment we did uh, with just high intensity interval training. And this was done in uh, vitamin D sufficient mice. And it's pretty well established that exercise in general increases the amount of muscle nuclei you have per muscle fiber. And so we're visualizing that here. We see the sedentary mice, um, mouse has significantly less blue dots indicating each nuclei. And nuclei are important because they contribute to maintaining muscle mass and or increasing the size of the muscle, a, a process called hypertrophy or hypertrophy. 
And, and so one key aspect that drives the amount of nuclei in the muscle following exercise are a cell type that are found in the muscle called satellite cells. And so these satellite cells are activated during exercise or during um, injury. And so we're, we're seeing actually a muscle fiber here. This is an experiment where we took a single muscle fire, fiber and we're taking a photograph every 15 minutes. And we see that the muscle satellite cells have emerged from the fiber and they're starting to proliferate. And so typically this is the response that happens. You get an injury or, and or you exercise. The, act, the satellite cells are activated. Uh, they will divide and you'll see some of these cells mitosing. Uh, if you could uh, zoom in on individual ones. And half the cells will then go back to the dormant state to get ready for the next exercise event while the other ones contribute to nuclei that allow for greater hypertrophy and for uh, maintaining the muscle fiber. And so after about three days, this is what we'll see in a still shot is you have your muscle fiber and all the muscle satellite cells that have emerged from it. And so we look to see how exercise affects this. And here we have a six month sedentary mouse, uh, this muscle fiber, and we see a pretty robust response in the amount of satellite cells that emerge from this. However, when we look at a 24 month old mouse, we see that this is significantly diminished. Only a few satellite cells emerged after the three days. However, we uh, gave another mouse six weeks of high intensity interval training, and we saw that we could restore mo most of those satellite cells that emerged. So we, we gave that exercise mouth the more youthful biology. Our question though is, does vitamin, vitamin D somehow play a role in all of this? And so here we're gonna see how vitamin D receptor is in the muscle itself. And so we look on the left here is a picture of muscle fibers. And so this is a, a cross-sectional cut of muscle, approximately one-tenth of a millimeter thick. And it's uh, cut uh, lengthwise so that you could see the muscle fibers themselves, and you see those individual circles represent, representing the fibers. The blue dots in this photo actually represent the nuclei, and these are typically found on the edges of each muscle fiber. So now we're gonna overlay vitamin D on those nuclei. And we see that the vitamin D receptor often aligns with the nuclei, and the arrows indicate where those vitamin D receptors are. So we have a, a good system to take a look at vitamin D is changing. So we're now gonna see how exercise affects this. And again, uh, here we have a six month sanitary mouse. Now we are just looking at the vitamin D receptors uh, represented by these individual dots. And if we look at a 24 month old mouse, uh, it's a little difficult to see, but it, it is a bit more sparse uh, indicating that there's less vitamin D receptor expression. However, following the exercise, we do see that there is an increase again. And uh, if you pay a technician enough money, they will count these individual dots for you. And uh, what we see is that the six weeks of exercise in these 24 month old aged mice was able to restore some of that vitamin D receptor expression. What was also interesting is we asked the question, okay, so is this something that is due to the six weeks of exercise, or is this a very transit response that right after exercise, you get a, an uptick? And so this is a process called a Western blot, where we take an extract of a of muscle tissue, and we separate it out, out all the individual proteins by their size. And we see a very faint band uh, representing, if I could get my mouse to indicate here, kind of representing the vitamin D receptor in a sedentary aged mouse. However, after the six weeks of exercise, I'm sorry, after just one hour following one bout of our exercise, we see that there's an immediate uptick in how much vitamin D uh, receptor expression. And so we also asked the question, okay, what about just supplementation alone? Does that change the amount of vitamin D expression in the muscle? And so here we have uh, mice 
uh, that for also six weeks, uh, and these are aged mice, 24 months of age, were either given no vitamin D in their chow or given a large amount, 8,000 uh, IU per kilogram of vitamin D in their chow. And we found after the six week period that indeed just the supplementation alone also increases the vitamin D receptor expression in the muscle. And so then the question is, is vitamin D potentially doing something? And so we're gonna investigate these mice a little bit more, but first we're gonna look just to see with between young and old mice, is there a difference in how much, um, how many satellite cells are actually found in the muscle? And so here we have on the left side, a young mouse, and each of these arrows are indicating one of those satellite cells that we've seen from the previous slides. When you look at an old mouse, you see that there's much uh, less of these cells present. And so you really have to scour around uh, all the different area of the muscle to identify just a few of these cells. So the amount of satellite cells definitely declines uh, with age. However, with vitamin D supplementation, uh, and so in this case, uh, these are mice that were 24 months of age and they were given four months of 8,000 IU, we see somewhat of a restoration of the amount of satellite cells that were found in their muscle tissue. And so this is very promising that uh, supplementation might be beneficial for exercise. And so these data were very preliminary. Um, in some cases, uh, some of these experiments were just finished a week or two ago. So uh, they're very exciting. We got a lot more work to confirm these, but I'm hoping you could give me a little leeway to uh, throw my speculations out there as to what might actually be going on. And so I question whether vitamin D may be the seasonal sensor. And what do I mean by that? So high intensity interval training, as we've seen, increases the number of satellite cells. And this increases muscle mass. And so those sat satellite cells will fuse, add nuclei, and ultimately contribute to the growth of these muscles and also the maintenance of the muscle mass. However, there's a caveat to that. And if you have more muscle mass, there's a higher energy cost in both developing that muscle and also just maintaining the muscle. It's a very high energy tissue. And the problem that creates is in the winter when there's low food. And so with low food, you run the risk of starvation if after every exercise event, you're growing muscle that you don't need. However, in the winter, there's also less sunshine. And because of that, there's lower vitamin D. And the low vitamin D will help stop every exercise event from generating the muscle. And that will reduce the muscle mass. So that makes it so that you could survive those winters by not wasting energy. However, there's a different aspect to muscle mass and that it contributes to your function. And so what's the issue there? Well, in the summer, the risks change. It's no longer a low food problem. It's that you may be hunted by sleeping, you know, those bears that woke up from hibernation. And so now you're gonna to wanna to get more physically fit. And in this case, now there's high sun in the summer and this is actually gonna increase your vitamin D levels. And so the vitamin D will then contribute to the satellite cells and give you a more re re robust response for every exercise event you have and make you more functionally capable of escaping the predation. Now this is speaking in evolutionary terms. So what does this mean for humanity who's moved on to a new phase, if you will? Well, if we start thinking about what's going on over the years, when we start thinking 10, 20, 30 years, and what you have is summers come, winters come, you have increased muscle mass, you lose muscle mass, so on and so forth. Uh, if you're outdoors and active, then even with uh, proper vitamin D levels, you're going to be seeing some decline. However, with uh, modern man, many of us are living in what we could consider a perpetual winter. Since we're staying indoors all the time, we're not getting those vitamin D boosts. So our vitamin D levels are lower. And in the summers, we're not getting that same amount of muscle mass development that we should be getting. Over 10, 20, 30 years, that might lead to sarcopenia. 
a condition where we have low muscle mass and therefore we have uh, functional difficulties. And one possibility though, is we could be in perpetual summer and by supplementation and also undertaking high intensity interval training, we could have more robust responses to all our exercise responses. And over time, this will lead to greater muscle mass with time. And so with that, I'm going to uh, turn it over to Bruce for some final words. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ken. So I'm just going to share three more slides with you folks. And I wanted everyone to know, as you probably might have gleaned, uh, and hopefully, first of all, can you see my slide? Yes. Yes, yes. good, thank goodness, okay. Um, as you might have gleaned, uh, we're very eager to recruit participants into uh, ongoing and future studies. So we wanted to make sure you folks knew how to get a hold of us so that we can get a hold of you in the future. So we do have a website for our University of Buffalo Center for Successful Aging, and that's the address in the large letters below. Uh, you have to use the lowercase CSA for Center for Successful Aging. That'll bring you to this page. And what I'd like to suggest is that sure, you can explore our site. Uh, there's some aspects under construction, but what's very important is that up at the top, there are two buttons, one that says join the mailing list, and one that says contact us. Now it turns out they take you to the same page and it's this page here. And what we would very much appreciate for those who are interested in reaching out to us is to give us your name and your email. And if you like to, and it's optional, you can give us your phone number and address. <clears throat> and this is really for a couple of reasons. One, uh, as uh, we continue moving forward, we will be having additional programs virtually for the community. Uh, we're also hoping that once the pandemic uh, wanes, that we'll actually have some in-person events and because we want to engage the community and you can see that with Dr. Sacha Danan's uh, work, uh, but also, and very importantly for us and maybe for you, uh, we'd be thrilled if you folks would consider being at least available so that we might be able to enroll you in some of our clinical trials. So I just wanna end with this final slide and then we'll have some questions. And I know there are a number of questions that have already been posed in the chat uh, and we have some that were put ahead of time. So you might uh, ask a question or at least I'll ask, what is the prescription for a healthy and long life? Well, I'm gonna say that first of all, if you choose your parents wisely, you're ahead of the game. And so some of those examples that I showed with the 105, 104 and 99 year old uh, individuals, they probably chose their parents wisely but we wanna help uh, uh, add on to that. Uh, and so there are some other very common sense prescriptions in a way, healthy and social lifestyle with safe non-risky behaviors. That means also being careful with exercise. Uh, and by the way, this is high intensity and not necessarily high impact exercise, avoiding uh, dangerous habits, eating sensibly. And of course, we're gonna recommend vitamin D and by the way, 2,000 units a day is probably a wise starting point for most individuals. Uh, and then of course, we wanna recommend exercise, but the exercise we're recommending is high intensity interval training, where we think you're gonna get a lot of bang for your buck, at least figuratively speaking, when it comes to the time invested. And then of course, uh, the final thing for uh, a long and healthy life, well, we're hoping that you'll support and participate in aging research. So, we're happy to take questions. I'm gonna stop the screen sharing and I think Dr. Berger is going to throw us some questions. I'm gonna pitch them right at you. Yes, that's true. So um, thank you for, for really interesting and fascinating talk. And we do have questions that were in the chat box as well as those that were submitted in advance. So why don't we start with a few questions to Dr. Seldin that were um, raised during your talk. Um, so the first, I think Dr. Tron alluded to, you recommended 2,000 units of vitamin D. We know that A, D, E, and K are lipid-soluble vitamins, and, and you can develop hypervitaminosis, extra, too much vitamins. Um, is there a ceiling that uh, people should be concerned about in terms of uh, their dose of vitamin D? Right. So... Um... So, I mean, as the data suggests, we, we could sit in the sun for 10, 15 minutes and get 10,000 IU in one shot. Uh, however, the National Academy of Medicine recommends no more than, uh, I think, 4,000 IU 
Um, there, there are some uh, studies that indicate that going above 4,000 IU may actually have some risks. Uh, I believe uh, one was indicating that uh, greater falls might actually be a risk. Um, but I, I would suggest like staying between that two and 4,000. Uh, however, you can buy a vitamin D test from Amazon. You could ask your general practitioner for a vitamin D test and you could uh, see where you're at. And some individuals may need more than that amount. Yes, if, if I may just add on to that. So for those whose physicians have been able to determine that you're clearly deficient, there might be a regimen of 50,000 units a week. Uh, and that's very important to follow. But what some of the studies have shown that for individuals who sometimes take 100,000 units or even 500,000 units, there could be increased risk, not only over the long term when it comes to falls, but also, and fractures even, even though that's counterintuitive, but also we don't want to cause hypercalcemia, high levels of calcium. But for the most part, most people in the absence of kidney disease or what's called hyperparathyroidism can safely take one to 2,000 units a day. So thank you. So there really is too much of a good thing. Yeah. Uh, yes. And also just to be sure people heard, your doctor may prescribe if you are deficient 50,000 units for per week for a short limited yes. time. Yes, for probably only eight to 12 weeks yeah. at least. Yeah, thank you. So another question in the chat was asking for a little more explanation of again, what Dr. Trone alluded to. What is the difference between high impact and high intensity? And is, can you achieve some of the same results with high uh, intensity exercise? Um, I, can, I, can, I can field that. Um, so high impact exercise really refers to impact on the joints and the connective tissue. Um, when we refer to high intensity interval training, that's really um, the high intensity it refers to the workload, how hard you're working at an exercise. So high impact is you know, certainly beneficial in, in very specific ways related to the structure of the joint um, and things of that nature. But we don't, we're really, I wouldn't recommend for an older adult to, especially to begin engaging in high impact exercise. The high intensity really is, as I said, refers more to the to the workload and being able to sort of bounce back and forth between a, a lower intensity and a higher intensity exercise, which has very, very distinct benefits. And that's often, if I may add, in the cardiovascular system. Uh, and that's why, uh, so when uh, Nick uh, and Dr. Mader, they're measuring the maximum oxygen consumption, that's a function of both heart and lungs. Uh, and so it's in a way uh, a wonderful result to say that even though we're training for the cardiovascular physiology with high intensity interval training, there are additional benefits as we are saying with strength and endurance. So that actually leads nicely, Dr. Trone, to a series of questions that relate the exercise to various disease states. So the first question uh, is, what is the maximal heart rate? And uh, is the goal to achieve 100% of the maximal heart rate, 80% of the maximal heart rate, 75%? What do you recommend? Well, I'm going to toss this back to Nick, because I think this is a good point to talk about perceived exertion here. Sure. So on paper, right? The formula that you use is 220 minus your age. That's your maximal heart rate. But that ignores any problem, any cardiovascular issues that you might have, any you know, pre-existing conditions, pre-existing issues at all. So it's, it's for the scientists out there, you can use it for specific purposes, but it really does not get at the idea of individually tailoring or developing um, a more individualized way of monitoring exercise. And that is really where rating of perceived exertion can come in. So RPE is a very simple way of self-prescribing exercise based upon how your cardiovascular system, how your respiratory system feels. So you engage in a given exercise and then you have to sort of anchor yourself to that scale. So it's a scale of zero to 10, <clears throat> zero being sitting still doing nothing, 10 being the hardest work you've ever put in, hardest exertion you've ever put in. And you want to be, for high intensity interval training, it takes a little bit of time to get used to anchoring, but as you progress through an exercise, say it's cycle, cycling on a recumbent bike, 
you should be able to say on a scale of zero to 10, where are, where you are on that scale. Now for high intensity interval training, the recommendation is for the higher intensity phase, you know, an eight out of 10, maybe a nine out of 10, depending upon your current fitness level and your other issues that may exist. And then you want to be right around a four or a five, maybe a six, depending upon the program that you're in for that lower intensity rest phase or recovery phase. And it's a really easy way and very, very good way to self-prescribe exercise in a way that is, you know, you don't have to rely on instruments. You don't even have to have a heart rate monitor if you don't want to have one. Um, and in terms of prescription, it's, it's a really, um, it's a much more user-friendly way of, of getting at exertion. Thank you for raising that issue of, of RPE. I, I know there's a number of commercial uh, products that use that. Right. Uh, yes, true. And, and so those are, are valid and, and safe for, uh, for those of us who rely on those to use for training. And, and yes. it, it, helps to, it helps to inherently make that individually tailored for the exercise. And so with our clinical trial, in a sense, we were able to help the participants understand what that uh, perceived exertion was compared to what our data was with the 50 and 80% VO2 max. Another uh, individual is asking about um, exercise for if you have various forms of arthritis. So what is your recommendation for individuals who have arthritis of their lower extremities, whether it's uh, osteoarthritis of the knees or osteoarthritis of the hips, what would you recommend? Yeah, so I'll, I'll take that. So we know that in general, that actually movement is good for osteoarthritis. We're not talking about rheumatoid arthritis, but we're talking about degenerative joint disease. So the challenge there is to have a graded level of movement and even some impact based upon uh, discomfort and perceived exertion. Uh, so in fact, what we know is that there are other studies with somewhat younger people that show that people with osteoarthritis can successfully engage in high intensity interval training. And now we chose our recumbent bikes for just that reason that uh, there is less stress, not no stress, but less stress on the knee joints and on the hip joints. I actually personally participate in a high intensity interval training because I have a stepper at home in our basement. Well, I'm putting more weight on that, but actually I'm still not moving my feet off and up and, off and, up and down on the stairs. So it's still a relatively mm -hmm. lower impact. If you were to run up and down stairs, that would probably be something which would be counter uh, recommended from this standpoint. But as long as you're doing this with the approval of your clinician, you want to make sure there's no structural change that would uh, prevent this, then yes, really just about everybody with osteoarthritis can be a candidate for high intensity interval training. I, I hear, thank you. I hear I'm you. Sure, um, I'd also just like to add to that, that high intensity interval training could take many different forms and it, each individual could try to find what works for them. Um, you know, all, all the different ways that you could do it. Is, uh, is soreness a problem? And if somebody becomes sore, does that mean they should stop? Nick, you wanna take that? Sure. So um, soreness obviously can take on a lot of different forms. If you have soreness in the joint, if you have recurring or lagging pain in the joint, that's an indication of, of potentially a structural issue or overtraining of some kind. Um, delayed onset muscle soreness is a very different thing. And it is a very normal part of the process of training. Some people are more susceptible to it than others. Some people don't feel very much delayed onset muscle soreness at all. Um, my, my opinion on that is that, you know, to take it slowly um, and to progress slowly through it, especially in, if you're an older adult, um, but a little, you know, ex expecting a little bit of muscle soreness, you know, if your quadriceps are sore after doing, you know, um, cycle exercise, that's, that's normal. And, and to me, personally, it's a little bit of feedback from your body saying that you've done something good for yourself. Thank you for that. Uh, so here's a question um, about a different medical condition. 
uh, and I'm going to direct it to Dr. Trone. Uh, is there any impact uh, on either preventing or treating cancer um, in, in your work with high so, intensity interval training? So there's actually a fair amount of, uh, of, of data on exercise and cancer, though it's mostly within a rehabilitative setting. So often people who uh, are uh, experiencing cancer, whether it's uh, post-surgery, whether it's post-chemotherapy, uh, uh, they've either been inactive for a long period of time, or there might actually be a direct impact uh, of toxicity on their muscles. And so most of the field has really focused on whether or not you can help people uh, and restore their previous functional capacity. There's much, much less known about whether or not exercise per se can help to prevent cancer uh, or prevent recurrence. So I'm going to stop at that point there and say that my knowledge is certainly not great. And, and we would not pretend that that is the case. Uh, on the other hand, people with cancer, depending upon the type of cancer, can also undergo exercise. But then it's a question of make sure, making sure that there's good nutrition at the same time. Uh, so there was um, one of the questions from the chat, I think was in response to one of the earlier studies that you were describing where you identified improvement in areas of cognition, uh, in areas of mood, um, and uh, you know, as well as physical conditioning. Uh, in, when you look at those improvements, has there been any um, evidence that people were able to reduce their medications? Uh, have you looked at that? That certainly seems like a very interesting uh, concept. Well, so let me tease apart whether or not there are any medications that would benefit cognition anyways. Uh, it's uh, Speaking as a geriatrician, the answer to that is not really. Uh, and that's unfortunate because we don't have any disease modifying medications when it comes to dementia. Uh, we do have ways to help reduce progression of dementia, especially if it's vascular in nature by controlling blood pressure, controlling blood glucose, uh, those kinds of things. Uh, uh, but uh, what I would say is that uh, from a standpoint of quality of life, we're actually very interested in that. Uh, and we actually were somewhat disrupted uh, by the, uh, our clinical trial was disrupted by the pandemic, uh, but we have plans in gear uh, to actually call uh, our participants back and that's one of the characteristics that we will monitor. And in the future, it's going to be, I think, a very interesting indicator about quality of life. But I, I hesitate to make any specific predictions right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for that. I know, I know there was a recent uh, article I saw that was talking about the, quote, runner's high, and whether it's related to endorphins or uh, another neurotransmitter. Um, so... Uh, Certainly, if there is some relationship, maybe that could affect some of the medications that people take for right. and, depression and we, or anxiety. And we didn't have enough time to show the trials, but even in our high intensity interval training trials, uh, we monitored very closely uh, whether or not there was a, an appropriate, the, what, the levels of enjoyment, there actually are, are scales for levels of enjoyment. And everybody uh, maintained a high level of enjoyment, both pre and post. It was around, I think, Ken, it was like 90, 92%. Uh, so it doesn't mean that everybody enjoyed it, though even there were folks that did not enjoy it who nevertheless continued to participate. There, in, there was definitely one who wasn't a big fan. <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, yeah, of the uh, you know, over 20, 30 individuals I worked with, they, a lot of them really, they, they enjoyed it a lot. And, and, you know, part of this is not necessarily high intensity interval training. And this is one of the interesting facets of whether or not we can do this in the home remotely with maybe an iPad. There's this social engagement. Uh, there's also, and we had planned this before the pandemic. What about groups? Uh, so if you exercise in a group, and I think a lot of folks could appreciate very much so that to do it in a group, there's a lot of reward and engagement here. And so these are factors which are not so straightforward to tease out. We should call that the Beatrice factor, because I think yeah. that's the quote that you read, right? Uh, so I think we probably have time for just one more question, but obviously this is a topic that is um, of, of interest because whether um, you are concerned about your own healthy aging, the healthy aging of a relative, a parent, um, it, it really affects everyone. 
so I, I'll just read one more question, but I know that um, uh, there, there may be more. Um, so again, in relation to uh, one of your prior studies, um, you noted that there was improvement in the majority. And this particular question asks whether you followed the individuals who did not seem to improve and whether um, failure to improve was a predictor of uh, a medical condition such as coronary disease, hypertension, uh, some other medical condition. Have you followed those people who declined? Ken, you look like you'd like to answer. Go yeah, ahead. Yeah, I mean, I'll say a couple things. Um, so we're, we're still working through that data. Uh, however, a couple things that stuck out, we, we just now collected their vitamin D levels. We're going to see if that somehow uh, pertains to that. Uh, also, what was of interest is a, a couple of our participants were, um, uh, they, they previously had prostate cancer and therefore were on anti-testosterone therapy. And uh, actually one of them uh, improved, another one did not. So you know, there's a lot of factors to sort through, which is why we liked starting in the mice. <laughs> but um, you know, we're we're learning a lot here. <laughs> and and as and as uh, Nick actually put on some of his slides, uh, there's some fascinating uh, potential biomarkers. Uh, so we're looking at what are called microRNA. Uh, molecules that are found in the serum. In our mice, we can look at it in both the serum and their tissues uh, a little bit harder in humans. Uh, and we think that there's going to be an opportunity for having some predictive value with that or other inflammatory markers. But we're still really quite early in, these, uh, in the stages of trying to discern what are the predictors. Uh, but that's another reason why, again, I'm going to make a, a, a very uh, self-interested appeal for us as investigators. We would love for folks to come to our website, indicate their interest, and give us their contact information so we can reach back out to you. <coughs> Buffalo.edu slash CSA. A, uh, a shameless promotion, but I, yes. I am yes, I'm delighted, delighted that you did that. And so uh, we've come to the end of our session. Uh, students' class will be dismissed shortly. As Dr. Trone mentioned, there will not be a test. Um, right. But we do encourage you to um, go back, look at the video that will be posted and sent to all of you who enrolled as students. Uh, I think I want to say thank you very much to all our presenters. You really demonstrated the spirit of Finney Med School with showing um, lab to living room. Uh, and lab to why, uh, but uh, thank you so much. It was a wonderful presentation. I'm gonna go and take my vitamin D and uh, do a little exercise and eat dinner. <laughs> so good night and okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you everyone. Thank for you very much. for our next mini med uh, advertisement soon. Good night. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Night, night. Thank you. <laughs>